All right, thank you, David, and thank you everybody for tuning in and to the assembly in Midland Park. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share the message of the gospel with you. If you have a Bible with you, I would like you to open it to the book of 1 Peter and chapter 2. 1 Peter and chapter 2. Our subject for this evening will be the sinless sin bearer. The sinless sin bearer. The word sinless simply means somebody who is without sin. If you sit down to a meal, uh, not prepared by your mother, of course, but perhaps somebody who's just experimenting with cooking, maybe it's your brother or your sister, and uh, you sit down and you realize you need to have the salt handy and douse your meal with salt because you might say that the food is tasteless. That means it has no taste if it is tasteless. Well, when we describe the Lord Jesus as sinless, we are saying he has no sin. That's what makes him so special, so attractive, and such a great savior. What makes him fit to bear our sins? Let's read about it now in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're reading at verse 22 and down to the end of the chapter. 1 Peter 2, verse 22, and it's speaking about the Lord Jesus in this text. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit or guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, when people insulted him and said bad things about him, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He didn't say, I'm going to get you back. He was silent in his sufferings. He did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd, that's the Lord Jesus, the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Our reading began with the words at verse 22 that the Lord Jesus committed no sin. This is a, an aspect of the gospel that I wonder if maybe we do not touch upon just as much as we should the perfections of the Lord Jesus. We're presenting Christ to you tonight. We're commending Christ to you. We want you to put your faith in him. And he is well worth your trust. He is a perfect man. God manifest in the flesh. And it's a very important part of the gospel that we uphold and maintain that the Lord Jesus himself is without sin. This is what qualifies him to be our savior. This is why we're trying to direct your attention to him. It isn't a, a religion that has died for you. And there's no religion of men that we point to and say, there's the perfect religion. But we point to Christ and say, there's the perfect savior. And there are Christian leaders that we look up to, that we respect, that we learn from. But there's no Christian leader that is without fault. But Christ is without fault. We're not trying to appeal to you that uh, we have discovered or we are the perfect church. You're not going to find a perfect church here upon the earth. But what you can find is a perfect Christ, a perfect Savior. That's the Lord Jesus. Do you remember uh, in the Old Testament part of the Bible, one of the ways that people were to worship God was with animal sacrifices at times. It may seem quite strange in our day, but it was given by God. It was common throughout the ancient world. And on that one particular day of Passover, when Israel was redeemed out of Egypt, they were to take a lamb. And the lamb that was to be sacrificed, the lamb that was to be chosen, was to be a lamb that had no imperfections without blemish, without spot. As far as they could tell when they looked at that lamb, it was, it was a perfect lamb. Peter now in chapter one says, that's like the Lord Jesus. We can be redeemed through the precious blood of this Lord Jesus Christ, this lamb of God who is without blemish and without spot, a perfect sinless savior for you to rely upon, for you to follow, for you to obey, 
for you to be trusting in and save for eternity. He's a wonderful man. But of course, the point of what I'm saying is the Lord Jesus is not just a good man, but he is God for only God is without sin. God is light, first John tells us, and in him there is no darkness at all. <laughs> Amazing. There's there's never a wrong thought in God's mind or in God's heart. And the Lord Jesus is just the same, for he is God manifest in the flesh. Only God is without sin, and the Lord Jesus is without sin. We have read the words of Peter that he committed no sin. John will tell us that in him is no sin. Paul says he knew no sin. There is that threefold testimony. And when people watched him being crucified, there were people around the cross like Pilate and the Roman centurion and a man being crucified with him who testified to the fact that the Lord Jesus is faultless. He's innocent. He's pure. He's without sin. God manifest in the flesh. That's what so many of his interactions were proving when he when he healed people or when he revealed their sin to them. I mean, it is God who knows our minds and our hearts. Think of that time with the Samaritan woman who had a bit of a checkered past herself. That's OK. That didn't that didn't prevent the Lord Jesus from meeting with her in John chapter four. And he exposed just a little bit of her sin. She found no sin in him. And she goes back to tell the others in her town. She says, uh, he's told me everything that I ever did. Well, he hadn't told her everything, but she could see that he knew her heart and he knew her past. And she said, isn't this the Christ? He knows all about me. I've seen nothing wrong in him. Isn't this the Christ? And others came and concluded, this is the savior of the world. Or there are the times that people came to arrest him, like in John chapter 7. There were different times that they tried to trip the Lord Jesus up in his speech. They would ask him a tricky question about tax law. The Lord Jesus answered perfectly. Or they tried a tricky question about the resurrection. They were a little bit skeptical about it, but the Lord Jesus silenced them with his answer. And in John chapter 7, when they come to arrest him, and now they hear his teaching for a bit, they conclude Nobody ever spoke like this man speaks. It's true. That's because there is no other man like this man. No guile, no deception, no sin found in his mouth. When you go through that list of sins in Romans chapter 3 that says there is none that doeth good, there is none righteous, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. But when you go through all of that list, the, the, the part of the body that is highlighted the most is our lips and our tongue and our mouth. How easy it is to sin with our mouths. To say wrong things. To have a word escape our lips that we want to take back and cannot. God says all of those words will be brought into judgment one day. No judgment for the Lord Jesus. He committed no sin, no deception in his mouth. God in the flesh. So when the when the friends brought their paralyzed friend to the Lord Jesus to be healed, and remember they let him down through the roof. And before the Lord Jesus healed that man, he said to him, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees were frantic and they spoke up and said, who can forgive sins? But but God only it's only God that has the right to forgive sins. They were indignant. But they were right. Good for you, scribes and Pharisees. You got it this time. Only God can forgive sins. And of course, the Lord Jesus was saying that he was God. He has the right. To forgive sins. Your sins can be forgiven tonight through this man. Through this man, Acts chapter 13, verse 38, through this man, the Lord Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And through him, all that believe are justified from all things. Whatever sins may be in your past, whether it's whether it's just some bad words, whether it's some unkind things, whether it's something that you may deem far worse. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. There is forgiveness and acceptance in this perfect man. The grace of God in the Lord Jesus. 
All of those interactions, all of his wise words were proof that he is the Christ and a perfect savior. And it is this perfection of the Lord Jesus uh, that qualifies him for the activity mentioned in verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. The perfect savior, the perfections of the Christ, and now the sacrifice of Christ. He wasn't there for his own sins. He didn't have any. We've made that clear, haven't we? He committed no sin. The other two being crucified with him, they were criminals in their own right, getting what they deserved, one said. Not the Lord Jesus. He was there for our sins. The sinless man, God in a human body, became our substitute. He had a body for this express purpose to bear our sins in that body, to be our sacrifice and our substitute. Again, think back to that uh, sacrificial system of the Old Testament. It, it was a bit of a, a messy thing, wasn't it? If you stop and think about it. I mean, why, why does God ask people to bring an animal sacrifice and, and to kill it? There's going to be blood and, and guts. What is God? What is God telling them? You know, one thing he's telling them is that sin is a messy and an ugly business. Sin is no light thing. Sin's a serious thing. Not only is it messy and it's ugly, but but by having to bring a sacrifice and take its life, God is showing very clearly that sin leads to death. Sin leads to death. Ezekiel the prophet says that the soul that sins shall die. Romans 5, by one man sin entered into the world and death because of sin. Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. James chapter 1. When lust, lust gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it produces death. Sin leads to death. Sin requires death. That's what all those animal sacrifices are showing. Sin requires death. But in the mercy of the gospel, we can have someone else take our death. That's what the sacrifice was showing. There's somebody dying in your place. Instead of you being the one to die, they could bring a sacrifice. The same is true for you today. The wages of sin is still death. But in the gospel, there's a sacrifice for you and me. It's the perfect Lord Jesus. He is the sacrifice for our sins. Seated now at the right hand of God in glory. To, to show us that his work is done and that the sacrifice has been accepted. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9. Once in the end of the age, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What a great sacrifice. He hasn't taken the, the animal sacrifice. He hasn't taken the body of another, his own body, his own life, his own self, bearing our sins in his own body. On the tree. I mean, there's the problem, friend. It's our sins. He didn't have any. The problem was our sins. Now, if you're not a Christian, that's still the problem between you and God. It's your sins. Sometimes people, if you ask them, well, why, why are you still on the way to a lost eternity? And I say, well, I, I, I can't believe. I can't figure it out. And that, that may be true in a sense, but the real problem is your sin. That's what causes the separation between you and your God. And the Lord Jesus has come to deal with that separation. Our sin's the problem, but our problem has been placed upon Christ. We read it in the Bible. He bore our sins in his body on the tree again in those animal sacrifices of the old testament sometimes when that animal was on the altar they would take their hand in fact one time they would take two hands once a year they they take both their hands the priest would and with his hands he'd push his hands down push his weight down using his hands upon the head of that sacrificial animal symbolically 
figuratively transferring all of their sins from their body onto the body of that beast. Push their hands onto the head of that animal as if to say our sins are being placed upon him. And then that animal would take them away figuratively, symbolically. Well, this is what happens with the Lord Jesus, not, not figuratively, but really. Not symbolically, but literally. You don't have to find him to push your hand upon him. You can put your hand on the Bible. You can rest on the truth of God's word. His own self bore our sins in his body on the tree. I would just like you to think for a few moments tonight about why the Lord Jesus was on that cross. And what did he accomplish while he was there? And what was in it for you? And for me, I appreciate the cross because that's when Christ took my sins away. Once in the end of the age, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, Here's something really important to understand in the gospel. Let me come back to this. Uh, he bore our sins in his body, but he did not become a sinner. Still perfect. <laughs> if he became a sinner, then he's not worth our trust and faith for eternity. Then that sacrifice would, would really be no good for us. He'd, he'd have his own problem then. When the Lord Jesus took our sins, he did not become defiled or unclean or a sinner in God's eyes in any way. Our sins were placed upon him, but they did not infect him. He took the punishment for those sins. He bore the weight of them, the consequences of them, but he himself remained sinlessly pure and perfect. We can trust him. Be sure that we're good for eternity. You see, not only is the Lord Jesus a good man. Not only did he do good things, but he has a sinless nature. That's different from us. Our problem is not only what we have done, although that's a problem. Our problem is also who we are. Not only what we've done and the sins we've committed, but who we are. We are sinners with a fallen, corrupt nature. This is actually why we do wrong things, because we are wrong on the inside. But the Lord Jesus did no wrong, and there was nothing wrong inside of him. There was nothing to promote a sinful thought. Sinlessly perfect. No potential to sin. For he is just like God. He is God. Because we have sin, a sinful nature inside of us. We are susceptible to the effects of sin, not the Lord Jesus. He wasn't. We are. Now think, uh, think about the pandemic that's raging in our world at the moment. And if, if, I, if I'm healthy and I go to meet somebody who I know has been infected with a heavy dose of COVID-19. And uh, I go to them without a mask and I put my arms around them, I grab them by the shoulders and I hug them and I give them a kiss on the cheek and uh, they're breathing on me and I breathe upon them as we talk to each other. My breathing upon them does not confer my healthy status upon them. They're infected, they're, they're likely to infect me. It's contagious. Well, the Lord Jesus didn't live here during days of COVID, but there was, a, there was another disease common in his day he we read in the gospels of times uh, where you met lepers and uh, they were unclean unclean ceremoniously unclean they were separated from others unclean in their bodies you, you weren't to touch a leper that would risk you contracting the same christ wasn't afraid to touch a leper i love that scene is it luke 5 mark records it too i think matthew also and uh, it says he was moved with compassion. The leper wants to be made clean. And he falls before the Lord Jesus. If you're willing, you can make me clean. And the Lord Jesus, moved with compassion, reaches out and touches the leper. And the Lord Jesus does not become infected. The Lord Jesus does not become unclean. 
the disease is not transferred to him. The uncleanness is not transferred to him. Healing goes from the perfect Christ to the leper. He's uncontaminated. Christ is not susceptible to sin. Perfect, even in his death. I, I love that story from a, a few years ago, the summer of 2018, when 12 boys on a soccer team and uh, their coach or their assistant coach were trapped in an underground in a cave that had been flooded after they entered. Now, that, that's not the part of the story I love, but just wait for it. This was back in 2018, and they uh, they went down uh, to explore these caves, thinking they had lots of time to come back up. But heavy rains came in, and, and the caves were flooded, and they were trapped in a very small space quite a ways inland. They were discovered, I think it was nine or ten days later, July the 2nd, that uh, a team of rescuers discovered them. And they. Uh, it was several more days, July 8th or 9th or 10th, when it they were finally able, divers were able to get in there and rescue those boys and the coach and pull them back out. All 12 and the coach were rescued. Saman Kunin, he was a former Navy SEAL uh, diver in the Thai Navy. He died in that rescue. He sacrificed his life for them. There was a another name I want you to notice. Beirut Pakbara was another Thai Navy SEAL diver who participated in that rescue effort. He didn't die. But during that dramatic rescue, in very tight conditions and dangerous conditions, uh, Beirut was able to help them get out. But Beirut contracted a blood infection while he was underground. He fought that infection for over a year. But in December of 2019, he died as a result of that infection contracted during the rescue. He rescued others, but he became sick, unclean, in his rescue mission. Risked his own life, but his blood became defiled in his work. The Lord Jesus is different and greater. He, he went into a cave. The Lord Jesus' blood was sinless blood, precious blood that he shed for us. His body was laid in a cave after he had died. And uh, for you and I, the moment that we die, our bodies begin to corrupt. Because we're sinners. The Lord Jesus saw no corruption. No defilement when he's on the cross. No corruption in his body when it's laid in the tomb in death. And he rises again now in a resurrected, a glorified body, yet still the same body. And the Lord Jesus in that sinless body is still a sinless Savior who has conquered death and disease and sin and Satan. Rises back up to glory. He's accepted into heaven. He's sinless. God doesn't allow any sin into heaven. No corruption in heaven. God's going to keep heaven pure and perfect. But he welcomes the Lord Jesus into his heaven. Sits him at his own right hand. Satisfied with the sinless sacrifice. And the sinless savior. You can be satisfied with him too. If God is satisfied with him. You can be satisfied with him too. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. God raised him because God was pleased. Because God knows that the Lord Jesus was not there for his own sins. God raises him to testify to the fact that this man is righteous. He's vindicated in his resurrection. It's proof of his sinlessness. And he's still sinless. We can still trust him. Wasn't there for his own sins. The reason for the sacrifice. He was there for our sins. That we might die to sin. Live to righteousness. He died to make us good. To make us right with God. You can't be good. Without that sacrifice. Your sacrifices don't make you good. Your sacrifices don't give you righteousness. It's just the sacrifice of Christ. Not your own, his. That's what you need and that's all you need. 
is what Christ has done for us. The problem is our sin. The change can only be affected by this sinless man who takes away our sin. The problem is our sin. The change to make us right with God and to enable us to live a life that pleases God. That change can only be affected by a sinless man who takes away our sin. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And now we surrender to his shepherd care. We put our trust in him. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. We're the sheep that go astray, but he's the good shepherd. And once we are in the fold and the flock of the Lord Jesus, listen to this other great part of the gospel. Once we're in the flock, the arms of the Lord Jesus, we're secure forever. He's a sinless shepherd. He never fails. My salvation did not depend on me bearing away my sins or me making a sacrifice for my sins. No, that was secured by Christ's work. And my preservation as a Christian, my security in God's flock is dependent still upon the sinless shepherd, the sinless savior, the sinless Christ. So I just want to turn your attention again to him as I close and appeal to you to think about why he was on the cross and what was in it for you. Listen to what the Bible says. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. He did it for us. He did it perfectly. And he's worth your trust tonight.